Hello, everybody. Um, my name is it's Eddie, and um, I have the pleasure of presenting to you a few details on SMB. Um, this talk will focus just on very one special phase where the client is connecting to the server. We will look at certain flags which are exchanged during the handshake, and from there we will uh, examine the behavior of the client and server system. Um, whatever we see here can be controlled in Windows through parameters, through uh, properties of a share, through a group policy uh, object, or through um, uh, just a registry setting. Now, before we dive into that, there is one critical point that um, Betty has slightly covered in her presentation. Um, when a client connects to a server, your Windows workstations and your Windows servers both have to observe a large and long history of SMB file sharing. Now, SMB goes back to 1982, so that's 25 years of um, network protocol right there. That protocol has been expanded, features were added, uh, until it is now in a shape that we use in Windows 10 and Server 2016. So the majority of trace files and details that I cover here will uh, refer to Windows 7, Windows 10, and Server 2016. And now just a quick question here. Who of you is using Windows or more interested in Windows in a domain environment, like an enterprise network in domains? Well, that's quite a number of, of uh, people here. Okay, who of you is more concerned with Windows in smaller networks that use work groups or home networks? Just one, two, three, okay. Now we focus on enterprise networks and certain things are different in enterprise networks. We will get to that. Now, the first thing that happens when the client establishes, it is after the client has established a TCP connection, it goes to the server and offers a selection of SMB dialects. So we call it an SMB dialect if a workstation is like supports SMB1, like it was used in Windows XP, for example, or SMB2 in the variations from Windows Vista and Windows 7, and starting with Windows 8, an SMB3 version was introduced. And each version brings with it certain capabilities, certain features. Um, the very old versions of um, SMB would only allow plain text authentication, which is a big no-no in today's world. So the later we had various encryption, uh, or various methods to exchange encrypted passwords, currently we hopefully all use Kerberos tickets to authenticate against the file server. And these capabilities were added over time, and the workstation and the server has to find a common set of parameters to identify how they can um, request certain functions or deliver certain results. Now, what we see here is on a newer system, on a Windows uh, 10 system, uh, you would see a selection of available um, dialects, and you see here in several numbers added. Now, this one starts right away with SMB2. Now, SMB2 has been introduced with Windows Vista. I've covered that in my talk at, Sh at Sharkfest last year, how it was with SMB1 and SMB2. Who of you would not know the fundamental differences between SMB1 and 2? Where you feel like, I could be would you feel more comfortable if I spent just two minutes talking about that? Okay. Who of you has still, no, I will not ask you, but please ask yourself because it's embarrassing if you have to raise your hand and I want to embarrass anybody here. But probably you will have in your network somewhere a computer running Windows XP, Server 2003, or anything older. The other day, I have encountered somewhere a Windows 95 system, which was like, oh my god, we still have these. Now, these systems run with an older version of SMB. 
That version of SMB was actually goes all the way back to a gentleman called Barry Feigenbaum, who at that time worked with IBM and has developed a protocol that would exchange files without using TCP IP. So that very old protocol, which was in LAN Manager, NetBuoy, NetBIOS, all that writes directly on an Ethernet frame or a token ring, if you still remember token rings. And later, IP headers were added to that, and the protocol was found in Windows NT, in Windows 2000, um, in Windows XP, and it was like every player in the storage industry and a lot of companies working in the uh, IT industry added features to that open protocol. And if you look at an old handshake from NT4, you might see uh, things like an Xerox-related um, SMB di uh, dialect. So that is all a lot of detail and, and, and a lot of old junk that was more and more added to that protocol. And it was very hard for Microsoft to maintain all these dialects. They brought with themselves a number of restrictions which definitely slowed down um, SMB and made file access, especially in a geographic dispersed network, very difficult. So if you have, say, one server here in Europe and you have a workstation sitting in the United States, you have several thousand kilometers or miles distance between these two workstations. And response times are greatly driven by the speed of light or by the speed with that bits get uh, travel over the cable over the wire. Now, we cannot change the speed of light, so the protocol has been changed to allow better performance over these wide area networks. That is one of the huge differences and one of the huge advantages in using SMB2. Now, that was introduced with Windows Vista. Now we are at Windows 10. We had several major updates in the, in the Windows operating system, and most notably, um, by the beginning of the year, um, uh, a set of vulnerabilities became known in the old SMB protocol. They're known as Eternal Blue. Who of you has heard about Eternal Blue, WannaCry, that Petya thing? Now here, hands go up. Actually, these refer to a certain vulnerability in the SMB protocol. That, and I talk about the old SMB protocol as it is found up and to, and including Windows XP. This allows an attacker, by crafting special packets, to take control of the vulnerable workstation or the server. And by now, we have seen various waves of malware that have exploited that vulnerability. So if you look at WannaCry, if you use that WannaCry as a term, or Petya or not Petya, which was a malware wave that hit mainly the Ukraine and a few um, systems in the neighboring country. These um, malwares caused great damage. They basically left the computer unresponsive or unusable. Um, so you want to remove your old XP systems and among the more popular or more well-known companies or the more well-known victims of that vulnerability are FedEx and the shipping company Maersk. Both of these companies have stated that this malware attack has caused financial losses in the area of approximately $300 million. So get rid of SMB1 because for the most companies, a loss of $300 million is probably deadly. So you have to be very big to, to cover with that, to be able to, to shoulder that type of loss. And certainly, it is a lot cheaper to upgrade your infrastructure, no matter what it costs. It's probably cheaper than 300 million to um, upgrade to newer equipment. Now, still today, your workstation can be enabled to um, go into that XP compatibility mode. But a modern Windows 10 system will tell you, no, at least we want to have the functional level of a server 2008. If you want to have a communication between Windows 10 and XP or Server 2016 and XP, you have to fiddle your configuration. But the big message is turn off that SMB1 thing. And therefore, we only look at SMB2. I'll show you one short trace file, how it looks when the Windows 7 system establishes a connection. So you will notice that in the protocol column here, you notice the first 
line lists SMB as a protocol and all other lines are labeled SMB2. Now, by the way, everything I'm looking at here only covers the, SM, the application layer. So I'm looking at SMB or SMB2. I'm not looking at TCP, at TCP handshakes, at window sizes, etc., at retransmissions. I'm not interested in that for the purpose of this talk. Now, you see that the workstation sends one single SMB packet, and that SMB packet will be understood by older implementations of uh, uh, SMB, like t Server 2003, and by, latest, by the latest server, like a Server 2016. And here, the server, uh, sorry, the client, presents a number of dialects that it would support. And you see here, the old PC network program, LAN Manager 1, um, Windows for Workgroup 3.1, if you still remember that one. So you can here use like literally 20-year-old protocols to uh, exchange data. Now, note that we have here SMB2 with three question marks, which indicates, hey, remote server, I could speak various variations of the SMB protocol. Um, but let's see, what do we have here? Microsoft had ultimately decided that this list could grow forever and ever and become very long, so they have decided with SMB2, we just sent here one general um, wildcard character, and the server would then say, well, if you speak SMB2 something, let's see, what exactly can you do, um, uh, or what, what exact version we can find, and where is it? In the next step, the server will, uh, the client will present here the available SMB2 something common um, dialect versions that they could use. And they usually, client and server, choose the highest common protocol dialect. That is, in general, what we want to see. Um, as usually, there are exceptions which we leave out for the second. So, the client offers a selection of available dialects, and the server will choose the highest common version. Starting with Windows 8, Microsoft pulled a very interesting marketing stunt. They added a version number, and they bumped the version number to SMB3. This was a marketing decision, as far as I know. The internal packet structures, the signature which makes Wireshark decide, oh, is that SMB or SMB2, that signature has been left intact. So it's the same signature for SMB2 and SMB3. And therefore, client and server, or therefore Wireshark will decode that whole thing as SMB2. Wireshark cannot at this time discern SMB3 and tell, oh, that is version 3. We know that from the handshake because we see 3 point something in the handshake, but Wireshark will display um, version 2 and 3 in SMB with the display filter SMB2. SMB3 is everything Windows 8 and later. So when I analyze that type of traffic, there are two main filters which start my investigation. The first one is I focus on the TCP ports, which can be 139 and 445. Both are used without, more or less for the same purpose. In 139, we had, just for compatibility reasons and compatibility with NT4, one extra exchange of information. But all major current traffics work on port 445. Now, if I'm only interested, once the TCP handshake has been sorted out and we see that there's no packet loss, no retransmissions, etc., I start in my analysis or focus my analysis just on the protocol versions of the application layer SMB or SMB2. Now remember, the display filter SMB2 will also cover SMB3. The most important takeaway message that I want to give you is turn off SMB1. Uh, there are several articles on the Microsoft homepage how you can do that. Turn it off. There's 
there are several methods around. You can fiddle with the registry. You can play, write a number of um, PowerShell scripts. You can use your group policy option in a, a domain joint network. So, but just turn it off. One feature that I find very interesting is called SMB multipath. SMB multipath um, breaks a certain habit that we that is time tested. So. For the last 25 years, we have seen that an SMB connection limits itself to one TCP connection. So there's a strict relationship. I access one share, which uses one TCP connection. That's it. That brings in itself certain limits. Um, you've probably seen Jasper's talk about TCP. If you remember things like um, uh, receive side window, receive uh, the transmit windows from, from uh, used in TCP, um, the detection of packet drops and the reaction to tra tra traffic uh, packet drops that can cause TCP to throttle its whole send rate and so that you will not saturate a link. In other terms, if you have one TCP connection and you have a 10 gigabit link between um, the client and the server, you're likely to have it probably running at 7.5 gigabit in the long run in terms of use, depending on the recovery algorithms, how TCP reacts to that packet loss. Now, to get around that, Microsoft has added SMB multipathing, which means the client can use multiple TCP sessions. Now, just for a second, what is happening when the client connects to the server? We had that negotiate protocol request where the client introduces its own available version numbers. The server sets one, uh, selects one of these versions, and then the client would authenticate itself. That is done with that statement called session setup request and the response. Now, the workstation usually knows which share I want to access. And we have to find out, in this file, I've created a server called DC1, and I've added a share called trace files. Now, you can guess what you'll find on that share. And it is possible that the data is replicated between various servers. That process of replicating the same information, the same files over various servers is done with a feature called the distributed file system. That is very common if you load login scripts or if you load policies from a special volume called syswall. So there's one share found on every domain controller, which is the syswall share where you find uh, group policy files, where you find logon script and other uh, information. Now, that would be a typical DFS-enabled share, and the client can select each one of the available servers using a feature which I will not cover right now, um, the server, the client can decide to choose a geographically closed server to obtain the information. Now, to find out if that special share is accessible through DFS, the client makes a special connection to that thing called IPC dollar. IPC stands for inter-process communication and allows exchange, general exchange of information. And now the client is asking, hey, I need to know about that thing here, trace files. Would that share be available as a DFS share? And the response is no. First, we get a status is pending. I'm working on that. Stay with me. And within the same millisecond, we get a no, status not found, which means it's not DFS enabled. It's not a decision if that share is available on that server or not. That will be determined in the next step. It's just the information that shared trace files is not DFS enabled. Great. When I have, dear server, I would like to access that trace file share here directly on you. And that is where we get the tree connect response. And now we can access files on that share. We have now probably um, a virtual drive letters, a drive letter like S or X or whatever your, your shares hold, uh, whatever you specify. Now, this sequence of event has been used billions and billions of times in communications between client and server. SMB multipath changed that because right now everything is happening in one TCP connection. 
starting with Windows 8, we got multipathing. And now, after the client makes the initial connection to the server, it asks, hey, server, would you have more than one network interface? We see here that special query, IO control, um, query network interface info. And the, the server then responds and goes, hey, yes, look here. Um, I got a bunch of IP4 address, IP6 uh, addresses. Uh, go pick something, and I have a bunch of of, of network interfaces that you can use to access data from me. And if you look here, the server reports like these are all 10 gigabit interfaces. That's great. Huh? So we have here like, um, what's that, six, seven, eight different inter uh, addresses, each of them with a 10 gigabit bandwidth. So we can suck a lot of data from that server. Let's go. Now, you all work in the networking area. How would your backbone respond to a client pulling down 40, 50, 60 gigabit with one GET request from the server. I dare say that um, about every buffer between the server and the client will be full. You will have packet drops in unrelated sessions. You might have, unless your quality of service is really well configured, you might lose te uh, telephone calls or um, you will encounter all types of problems. Well, let's see. Also, if you have a firewall between your client and your server, we'll see what happens next. Um, the number of states for, in the state table for the firewall will go up. Um, what also will happen is the client needs extra round trip times to use all these multipaths. So if you have a very long network with a lot of bandwidth, um, you have to decide if multipathing is really good for you. Now, as soon as the client has learned, hey, great, I know a number, of, I'm, I'm now aware of several IP addresses for the server, look what it is doing. It is adding like here, at this time, it's just 11, which is what I could roughly fit on that uh, slide here. It's opening 11 or even more um, TCP connections and SMB connections to that server. And note that all these IP version 4 addresses um, were found in the, state, in the earlier statement that we've seen in the first screenshot. And I've added all these colorful lines here by using a Wireshark feature, which is a right-click on the line and colorize conversation TCP. And that allows me to visualize the behavior of the client, and I see, oh my, yeah, he's now opening a number of TCP sessions. And each of these TCP sessions, oh, here's a slide so that you can find that out. Just a right click here on the, um, on the slide, and then um, you'll find here in there, one step lower, the uh, information, um, uh, colorized conversation. Now, since we no now have a number of TCP sessions, and they all refer to one SMB connection between client and server, I want to focus on all information exchanged between client and server. I can write very, very long display filters which rely on the IP addresses and TCP ports. When these become very hard to manage, there's a high chance that I skip a certain um, TCP port and I just forgot port number 50,010 or 11 or 12 or whatever I have overlooked here in my uh, long chain. So instead, as part of the handshake, the server will assign an SMB session ID to the client. And that session ID is this long number shown here in the SMB header, in the SMB2 header. And I can right click on that number because it's so long that I cannot just type it up without a, a typo. And I use that function here, prepare a filter, select it, and now I have the matching TCP filter or the, the matching display filter up in my filter line here. That gives me all the packets related to just this individual connection between client and server, no matter which TCP connection is being used. Just excuse me for one second. Angelo, I'm giving, I'm giving you a hard time. Are you still okay with all your movie things? Okay, good. Last year I was running around and he had a very hard time tracking me with the camera and uh, it looked a bit bumpy, I guess. So, okay. 
Here we go. Now, during the handshake, for every single handshake or every single TCP section, client and server will redo the negotiation of the SMB dialect. Um, there, are very, there are few situations where the dialect can change depending on the resource which you access from a server. So it, can, it might be that you have um, a mixed version, that there's a cluster of Windows servers with running mixed versions, and in that situation, the server might revert not to the highest available dialect number, but the highest available common dialect number for all servers. So it might be that the server downgrades to something that a 2012 server can understand, even if your 2016 server could do more. And now, please note that here, the client repeats its authentication. It goes like, hey, here's my session setup request. So you know that it's really me, the client, who has been authenticated earlier. And then we're asking something, some information about a file. So there's no tree connect statement, no query for a distributed file system. All that has been done in a different TCP section. And now we just continue working with whatever the user wants us to do. What I personally find very impressive in both implementation uh, from Microsoft and how Wireshark detects that and handles it is, um, it might be that one TCP session is used to open a file and a second TCP session is used to close the file. So that's within one SMB session, it's just the stream of application, whatever the user is doing, the client is just transporting through the SMB protocol, all the requests. And they are split over multiple TCP sessions, and Wireshark detects that. Please note that here I've chosen a display filter which focuses on one single TCP session. And you see that a close statement is in frame 395, and the file handle was opened in 394. And that frame number 394 is not visible. It's happening in a different TCP session. So if you are just focusing on one TCP session, just on a single server IP address, chances are that you are missing parts of the picture. You only get a fragment of the required traffic. And it would not make sense just to look at that close statement without the other information. It only makes sense in the context of the SMB session. So focus your analysis on the SMB2 session ID. When we want to analyze that little part of the handshake, um, there are, again, the two takeaway messages that I want to give you. One is focus on the session, on the SMB session ID, and the second one is just take a brief look at the TCP session it could be that your Windows server has multiple interfaces and one is just dedicated to, for backup purposes. Or one interface is just dedicated for management purposes. So um, if the client tries to access that backup or management network, it might be isolated, and that can cause a bit of TCP trouble there. But it should be easy to spot that if a SYN request goes unanswered. So you have to re make sure that the, client, that the server would not offer this special IP address, that protected IP address, to, um, uh, to the client. Another important part is that these, all these many TCP sessions running over multiple 10 gigabit links where a server is just pushing data into the network that can overload your WAN, especially if the systems, if client and server, are geographically dispersed. Um, luckily, we can get away with that situation, where, with the overload situation. There's a concept in Windows where you can define your, all your subnets, so you can configure all available networks in your Active Directory. You can link these network addresses to a concept called a site in the Active Directory, which is usually like a building or a city or just one entity where your company is present, one part of your network. And using 
again, a GPO feature, policy-based quality of service, you can define or, or you can limit the number of bits per second that a server would send into that network segment. So your server might have two 10 gigabit interfaces, but you as network administrators are aware that the slowest link is 100 megabit. You can tell that information to the server, store it in the active directory, and the server itself will limit it and just not exceed the bandwidth that you have configured, even if multiple clients are sending requests at the same time, which means we avoid TCP uh, packet loss just in the first place. And of course, the important message is, that's a $300 message for everybody who was encountering that or was threatened by um, old SMB systems, get rid of SMB1. Now, before we just stop that and go, dive into, pack, into caching, I'm doing a lot of talking here. Um, I hope I'm not too fast, but I want to do something that has never been done at SharkFest before. Please look to your left, look to your right, and I would like to give you like 90 seconds to talk to your neighbor and explain to him the most important point that you just took away from the first couple of slides. Is that okay? I give you 90 seconds. Just go ahead, talk to each other. What was the most important thing that you took away here from this part? Okay, I hope you could explain all, all of you got something from that. If you struggle with something right now, that would be a good idea and go like, hey, maybe come back to me later and we will save a few minutes for questions and answers. And that means I didn't explain myself clearly enough and I have to re-go into that topic again or we can clarify that up here for everybody else. Okay, next topic is caching. When a client is retrieving data from a server, the server may allow the client to cache the files or cache certain information, either locally or even transmit the files to other systems on the same network and go like, hey, I have some information here if you're interested, so we can do client-side caching and they call that um, either you can cache it locally, depending on the configuration. I'll show you how that looks in a second. Or we have something called a branch cache, where you have a network segments where all your workstations reside, and a client retrieves files from a central site and would store it, cache it locally, and make it available for other systems who are interested in just the same file, so it only crosses the network link once. That is called a branch cache. It can be stored either on all the workstations in one network segment, or depending on how you design your network, you might have one dedicated server which is used as a local cache, and that would be called a hosted cache. Now, that caching is part of the properties for um, a share. This screenshot here is taken from a server 2016 where I've configured a share and you're guided through a wizard and that wizard will ask you at one setting here, do you allow the workstation to cache data from this share? And we can even make it more specific and go like, hey, you can enable the branch cache for that file share, which means the data is not just available to this one client, but it would be available to all systems either in the same subnet or in the whole building if you want to configure it like that. 
So allow caching of share. Now, this is one of the points where we have to do a very fine, have to take a very good look at, um, at the trace file. Now, first of all, when the server responds in the tree connect response, remember, tree connect statement happens when I access a certain share name. Here it is called cache, uh, text. It's the, you see, like a bracket caching uh, with branch cache is enabled. And the server would indicate that here with this single bit, enable hash version one is true, which indicates, hey, um, you can cache that somewhere using the, um, the branch cache feature. Um, there are two different types available, enable hash version one and two, which are different implementation of that branch caching feature depending on what functional level you have. You can filter for that using the display filter um, SMB2 share underscore flex enable hash version one. Luckily, we don't have to remember these long topics here. Actually, let me show you a little trick in Wireshark. That should be visible. I hope you can read all that. And when I start typing in Wireshark, a filter name, for example, like the one we've seen here on the slide, you see that SMB2 dot share underscore flex. Um, unfortunately, I cannot make this big here, this, this filter line, so I'm typing it here. As soon as I type things here and start share underscore flex, Wireshark would offer an auto-completion feature and would show me all the available filters that fit here. Or you can find it here in the status blind at the end of your screen. This is completely unreadable on the, on the large screen. That is why I've typed it uh, in Notepad. But as soon as I start to type something here, dot, and you see how here a list of available uh, filters comes up. Now, the good part is, with my limited brain capacity, I could never remember, is it share dash flags or share underscore flags, share point flags? Now, that auto-completion feature is very nice because it shows me, like, these are the available selections. And if I type it fast enough, my boss will not notice that I'm just reading it off the list. He will think I'm a god in packet analysis because I know all the filters by heart. I certainly do not, especially not for such a big protocol like um, SMB2. Now, the server can also forbid the client to cache files. Now, there might be a good reason to do that, either because you know that this is highly volatile data, um, or you know um, for certain reasons you want to, don't want to have it on your workstation's disk because you don't trust the workstation. Um, so uh, the server can forbid the client to, um, to cache data. Now, note that here in the share flex, we have the number three zero. So the three would be two bits set, correct? We would expect that two bits are set to one in this number. Now, if you look at the Wireshark decode, you will notice that the lowest bit is decoded, the second lowest bit is decoded, and then there are six bits which are not explained. But clearly, Windows is using two of these flags here. So to spot that, I have to take a really good look at the trace file. And I have to examine these share flags. And if I suspect that sharing or, or that local caching could help me, I really have to dive into that. Um, luckily, um, the uh, uh, Wireshark developers who are in charge of um, the SMB2 decode, which is um, mostly Richard, who is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Richard, are you, are you here? Or? 
Oh, he's not here. It's a, it's a pity. So Richard Clark is doing one of the uh, is doing a great job in maintaining that. There is already a bug request open that um, someone requests a decode for that flag. So once in a while, when Microsoft adds new features to the protocol, it takes some time until really the last details are covered in Wireshark. But over time, they will certainly all um, come in. Now, caching can help you a lot. If you use that branch caching feature, the workstation will send a request, hey, I want to access that share. The server tells, well, branch caching is enabled. You see here that version one hash flag is being set. And then the workstation will retrieve a hash. Now, how branch caching works is um, the server splits a file up into, roughly spoken, into 64 kilobyte blocks. It chops it up into tiny pieces. And the client will first ask for a hash code of that interesting 64 kilobyte block. And instead of sending that 64 kilobit block, a kilobyte block over the line, we only transmit a short hash code. And then the workstation would ask all the neighbors or the configured cache holes and ask, hey, is that piece of information available somewhere here in my site? And only if nobody has that piece of data, then we transfer the whole data block. And you configure that, as most things in a Windows network, by using group policies. So um, your policy editor goes like policies, administrative templates, network, branch cache. Congratulations. Here is a whole set of things that you can configure. Now, this caching only kicks in by default if the round trip time between client and server is at 80 milliseconds. You can set that to zero, which means the client will always try to cache. There might be situations when you feel like, oh, well, I have my own bunch of fiber cables here for a cross-Atlantic cable, and I'm not worried about bandwidth. But the number of TCP turns hurt me a lot in my application, and you probably want to turn off that caching. Now, that depends on each and every individual uh, share and on the way how your users use um, the, uh, the, the infrastructure. So the important part is caching can be helpful, but check if it would be useful for you. It does not make sense to use a distributed branch cache for data stored in a user profile. Anybody got an idea why that could be? I mean, if I download files from my user profile with my personal documents, my pictures, and whatever I have, I download that onto my workstation. There's nobody else interested in that. But if you have a file share with a lot of, say, company policies or marketing documents that a lot of people have access to and a lot of people need, it makes sense that you copy it once and only the changed files or changed portions will be replaced. So. That might be a typical candidate that you put on a, on a uh, shared or, or on a branch cache enabled share. But for my files, nobody else but me with my workstation will access these files. One more part before we start with um, questions and answers, which is encryption. Starting with Windows 8, Microsoft has added encryption as an optional parameter to SMB3. So the client, uh, again, your server administrator will, let me increase that a bit, the server administrator will define as a property for the share, this has to be encrypted. This does not rely to data on the disk, but this refers to data in transit. So when a client accesses this share using SMB3, the, the data will be encrypted in transit. Unfortunately, it is very hard for us to investigate that in Wireshark. Again, here's a screenshot. The tree connect statement is where a lot of important details are revealed about the configuration of the share. In this time, you see, here's the number eight is set. Um, 
which means one bit has been set, and Wireshark decrypts it and, and decodes it and goes like, oh, yes, encrypt the data required. That is the, where, where the server orders the client, you have to encrypt all your requests, and I will encrypt all my responses. Note that here, the, again, the two bits for three are defined, which means something which is currently not decoded with Wireshark 2.4.2. Once this bit has been detected by the client, everything else will be encrypted. And all you see is like encrypted SMB3. And you cannot tell from the decode if that is a file open operation, if data is being read, if data is being written, um, if some lock management is happening or any other interesting things are happening on that wire. So no look into that, I'm sorry. Well, wait a second. Encryption is clearly an SMB3 feature. It has been introduced with Windows 8. Now, you might be tempted to break out that Windows 7 box and go like, hey, let's go to that share and let's start the application and see what's happening. No such luck. Here's the client sending a tree connect to the share called confidential and getting an access denied. So even though we are giving the right username and password, the server will reject access and will tell you access denied. Now, that could also be a return code for, sorry, um, we are missing the ACL on the server. You are missing the rights in the file system. But unfortunately, that access denied refers to a lack of protocol. So the workstation does not support encryption. The server knows. Remember, the server knows from the handshake, oh, we have chosen SMB 2.1 here for that Windows 7 client. And now we are requesting an SMB 3 feature. And instead of sending data out in plain text, Microsoft will not give you, or the Windows server will not give you access to that data. You need something newer, at least Windows 8, to access that share. So that is a bit misleading. Personally, I would have hoped for something more understandable, which points me into the right direction, like missing file system feature or uh, encryption required. But, well, that's what we get. Now, again, the important parts. SMB3 allows encryption of SMB traffic, but that requires server 2012 or later, or Windows 8, Windows 10 or later. Anything older will get the slightly confusing message access denied. Sorry, please say again. Yes, that is certainly one thing that access denied is certainly available as an error code that can be translated into, into something for the user. But it's probably one of the cases where you um, have a hard time in, in describing yeah, that. So mean, it is. They would not understand the return code. Yes, definitely. Yes. So access denied is probably not a bad choice because every SMB2 implementation would understand SMB, uh, access denied. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So if you see that access denied, you have to go for the SMB version that has been requested and go like, ah, is that my problem? Yes, and you have to dig a bit deeper. Yeah, definitely. The most important part, again, I cannot emphasize this enough, get rid of SMB1, even if you find that boring. Yes, there's a whole bunch of systems. Um, I know turning off SMB1 can be painful. There are scanners out which would store the documents which have been scanned through SMB1 on a file share. So you suddenly have to replace that scanner, 
Um, so there are all types of devices around which still speak SMB1. You might have point of sales terminals which are running with a special version of Windows XP. No chance that you will get, get them with um, SMB. Well, just start a project to replace all these old devices. Please, please, pretty please. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, not exactly an hour and 15 minutes, but um, we certainly have time for whatever question you have, uh, as long as I can answer them. Christian, please. You want to take a picture? Um, like this? Yeah. Ah. Thank you. Okay. No more questions? Is that because I overwhelmed you or you don't dare asking questions? Yes, sir. I'm not sure if you can do that. Actually, and I did not dig too deep into the Windows policies, but as soon as the server administrator checks the box and goes like, use encryption, then this is what the Windows 7 system does. Yeah. And I think it makes a lot of sense because you have confidential data. You don't want to have, expose it just because you have one old device. From, from a policy making sense, but there might be ways around that. You can certainly downgrade it. You can tell it like, well, use that trick with the uh, distributed uh, cluster thing. Okay. Yeah. That is very well possible. So the question is, there might be, or the command is, there might be a feature available in Windows that enables older clients to access the encrypted shares using unencrypted traffic, basically. So you lower your security requirements for older systems. If you decide to do that, okay, well, and everybody has to decide that case by case, certainly. Yes. And you have kind of server wide encryption, but the point in which the server says now you have to stop encryption is much earlier if you configure it server. Yes. Wide. So I, I spend a lot of hours trying to understand the difference, but it's not really documented. For a number of years, I think starting with Windows 2000, Microsoft has added IPsec, um, and uh, you can force through a group policy encryption of traffic between two systems based on IPsec. Uh, and I tell them, you have to use IPsec right from the beginning and use it even for DNS and um, whatever other traffic you have. Uh, here is Richard. Thank you very much. So, by the way, this is Richard, who is uh, doing a great job in, uh, with, the, with the SMB sector. Uh, and for those who did not hear it, let me repeat that. You try to put in a change that every SMB1 packet will be flagged in red through the Wireshark expert, indicating a potential security problem. Yes. Yes. Just like a TCP, uh, like, like a spanning tree topology change or something like that. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. I, I would love to see that in Wireshark. Any more comments or questions? Yes, please. For the for the file, so for the branch cache, how that works? Yes. Actually, um, 
file is the files are stored in an encrypted method on the cache host. So you have either um, the workstations that are all. So the question was like, how would data be stored for that branch cache thing? Uh, No, the f no, no. A piece is here, a piece is there. So it's not like the full file. It may be stored on one system if you have one hosted cache and define that one server to be your caching server. But um, if you have a distributed cache, data can be found anywhere. There's not necessarily is it restricted to one system. A bit like a torrent, yes. And it would be stored in an encrypted method. And the master key to that is it's documented from Microsoft. It is generated when you create your domain. And um, the process is not exactly easy to follow, but there is, it is stored in an encrypted and protected way. And unless you know that key, you will not be able to retrieve the data, that fragment, from the, from the hard disk. So to decode that, you have to be a member of the domain and need access to that key. Any more questions? Well, um, I hope you're not sorry that I'm uh, adding 50 extra minutes to your break then. Um, thank you very much for attending the session, and uh, please enjoy the rest of Sharkfest. <laughs>